Okay. So, do, do we have everyone? Or do, do we have everyone who is actually going to turn up? I guess so. I, I, is, is there anyone in DC? There is yes. Daniel Smith. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Ah, I suppose. Uh, oh wait, maybe no, I. No, that, 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 that would be in the. In the uh, can you hear us? Yes. Good. Excellent. Hi, Dan. Hey. Um, we, we have a... I, I was frankly expecting this to be a more popular session, considering that the other was uh, uh, the, the manager's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm I'm, I'm going to leave. See people flocking here. Like, ah. I, I will leave them to it. Uh, right. Um, for the benefit of those of you on the bridge, which I guess is only Daniel, we have uh, four representatives from Zen Server. We have Marek and we have Julian. Um, does anyone know what we're doing? So EFI specifically has its own separate design session, um, which... Yeah, I think th this is supposed to be Raphael's session, right? Yeah, yeah Raphael unfortunately had a family emergency and can't be here. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. So is B BQ and I were talking about this, and I, you know, I, I gave him advice to kind of come up with a slide deck that went through all the um, different patch series that, you know, specifically the ones that he had, he's having to... Yeah, so he, he's doing the Arch Linux yeah. stuff, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I said we could go at this point, we could try to collaborate on what Cubes is doing versus what OpenXT is trying to upstream versus the large patch view that even Zen client, or Zen, excuse me, Zen server has. <laughs> it's shrinking very slowly. <laughs> yes, yeah. very slowly. Same here. <laughs> I believe part of the point of these um, design session was to determine what parts uh, of the batch queues in the different projects were common and potentially upstreamable together. Uh, do we at least have some sort of idea of what those commonalities are? Uh, patches in cubes are segregated into few categories. Uh, some are simply backports uh, from uh, newer versions, so those are upstream already. Uh, some are patches that should be uh, submitted upstream, but uh, either were submitted and uh, required some new revision to, I don't know, uh, make it more generic uh, or something like that, or uh, some were simply not submitted at all, but in theory should be, should be fine. And there is a uh, a large part of the patches that uh, are specific to cubes, uh, either because we uh, do uh, like disable some features we don't use uh, in cubes, or we uh, do some uh, like my talk uh, about uh, stub domain. Uh, there are a bunch of stub domain features that are using cube specific features that are not uh, really the thing uh, upstream. Uh, so this is probably about, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 patches of the 60 something, I think. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's main categories uh, of the patches. Um, and to go through the uh, Zen server patch queue briefly. Um, <laughs> um, the, so uh, th th those of you who saw Yakis's presentation actually saw up-to-date numbers of what the Zen Server patch queue looks like. Something like seven, seven integration patches, 30 bug fixes and 39 features, or the other way, other way around for bug fixes and features. Um, in, we have a reasonable number of bug fixes that we have previously tried to upstream and encountered resistance for 
some reasons or another. And in some cases, the resistance was more reasonable uh, than maybe in other cases. Uh, the features are, for the most part, stuff that really shouldn't go upstream. Uh, we're pretty good at doing upstream first for most features. Uh, there's a few random bits and pieces uh, that I mean, we've still got a couple of features, uh, a couple of hacks for Bromium nested vert that we can probably just discard now and, um, um, and, and that the majority of the bug fixes are in areas we're still trying to work on. So we've got a lot of um, uh, CPU uh, CPU ID topology hacks in um, in, in in backports in the uh, in the patch queue. And uh, um, anyone who's been paying attention to the list will see Alejandro with a uh, with, with, with a whole mess of trying to tidy it. So that's an example where we will end up doing a completely different feature upstream that has the side effect of deleting most of the stuff in our actually Not all of it, because we've still got to maintain the backward compatibility, but the amount of technical debt shrinks to, uh, shrinks as a consequence of doing that. So most of the bug fixes in our patch queue are like that. They're things that require more work, uh, and then we will eventually discard at some point in, in the future when that work has been done. But of course, prioritization of the work is, uh, is very different to uh, getting it done. Yeah, arguably, we also, arguably, we also have a bunch of patches to support uh, weird cases of PV. Um, I think it was mostly to support uh, older versions of SUSE that behave weirdly for reasons. Um, and we have something like five or six uh, patches to PyGrab that should really not be there. And for... for um, I, I, I classified those as features rather than bugs. But. Uh, well, tomato, tomato. <laughs> uh, but the, 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 the point is that those patches should not be taken into consideration for newer uh, deployments of upstream Zen, I think. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure we have many things. Do, do, do we have anything else that is uh, worthy of upstreaming that we have been a bit neglectful of? There is one thing uh, that I noticed is the CPU statistics that actually change the ABI. So that means that you currently can't compile things like XenOpsD with a pure upstream Xen. What what would it take to make it acceptable uh, upstream? I don't actually know. I think the, I think the the complaint with that one. So we we've got a patch in the Zen server patch called called CPU mixed run state. Yeah, it looks like uh, CPU hazard and uh, yeah, the reasons why your is it locking contention or things like that. Yeah, so it, it, it's it's getting uh, it's getting a bit more fine grain information as to what the VCP was doing, um, and the thing is, it's just exporting stats that Zen already has, um, that has no other hypercalls to get them, um, and that that's that's the main one that's actually a pain in the ass to work with. Yeah, but it actually changes the API, right? So that's well, it, it, ab it adds a new <laughs> hypercall. It adds new. Uh, uh, new um, OCaml's um, C bindings. I have the number uh, from Cubes. Uh, so we have uh, 93 patches currently. Uh, from those, uh, 19 are Cubes specific. And there are um, four, 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 four. Here is the start. Let me count it. Um, so there are generic bug ports, 16 of them, and then 13 patches for uh, Intel uh, dub, uh, HWP. And ah, so those have been upstream, those have been upstream. But not in the version of Zen you're using. Yes, exactly. Uh, so those are ba uh, basically also right. backports. ports. 
and the section for upstreamable patches is 26. Um, yeah, and there are also various MISC patches, uh, the suspend one, there is it's five, uh, six patches, um, <coughs> which is ideally also upstreamable, but some are a bit controversial. <laughs> Um, and there is also uh, GVTG, which is is there, but uh, we are not going to support it uh, in, uh, in the future. So yeah, it will go away. But it's just free patches. So I yeah. Think Daniel said he wants to speak. Okay. Yes. So I just I, I wanted to hit what we have in OpenXT. So most of so we have about sixty two patches. Um, most of ours is actually against libxl to to have to have the ex, uh, appropriate behaviors to for our tool stack to integrate with it. Um, we have a few patches that are around making tboot work within EFI, which those will, those will never go upstream. Um, in particular, to make it work at, uh, after the shim. Um, then we also have here there's just a few um around argo some hyper call changes that we have in there uh one of the other ones that will never go upstream i don't think is that we have a hard requirement to to zeroize memory after a domain is destroyed immediately after it's destroyed it's not actually flagged as destroyed until the memory's been zeroized um yeah that's some other scrubbing a little bit against OCaml. That's probably more for just building purposes. Um, and it looks like we got some stuff against SM BIOS. So I'm not intimately familiar with all of them, but that's that's most of what we have. Yeah, actually for uh, Cube's patches, uh, uh, just looking at the list also, it looks like most is uh, about Linux cell and tool stack. Uh, there yeah. some hypervisor uh, patches, but not many of them. Um, when you mentioned tboot, you're talking about trusted boot, right? Uh, so the, the, it, yes, it's a thing. Its full name is trusted boot, but everyone calls it tboot, and it's the thing that the trench boot project is trying to file in dev null and replace with something that works. Um, there were talks about that earlier in the day. Um, uh, you, you can blame Daniel for that. That's his fault for choosing the name. <laughs> but, but yeah, d d do yourself a favor and don't touch T-Boot at all. It, we're, we're getting rid of it as fast as we can. Um, is not something that is upstreamable because it does sound like a good thing to have. We have that in Zen server as well, but I think we're. Uh, are we doing it asynchronously? No, we've got a patch queue in. So we've got a patch queue in the Zen server patch queue that says defer memory scrubbing until the APs have been brought up. Um, which I can't, I can't remember what that was from. Uh, it was, it was Sergey who put it in. Uh, basically, so I think it might be the Broadwell L3 cache errata. Basically, there's, um, in theory, microcode loading on one CPU is safe whilst you're doing other stuff, and in practice, it's not. Um, that might be something we need to look into upstreaming. It, 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 it was done in the middle. Uh, so the point at which that got put into our patch queue was also the point at which we had 60 other patches worth of uh, microcode loading um, that we'd done and shipped to customers and then upstream had demanded doing it differently. 
Um, I think that's just an area we haven't been back around to look at. Uh, the, so the, there's a specific bug with the L3. Uh, so Broadwell workstation CPUs are a weird mix where the L3 cache is tied to the core ID that it's so, so the L3 cache slice is tied to the core ID. Uh, and there are some L3 cache slices that have no cores attached to them and you can overflow their pending queue for snoops. Um, and so if you look in the upstream Intel microcode release, there's uh, there's a directory called in uh, called Intel U code with caveats, and there's a README in it that says don't don't late load this. And both Linux and Zen have taken the unofficial workaround of just do a write back and validate before you do it. But I think that also depends on making sure that the other thread is idle at the time that you're doing it, uh, which is why I think we've got that piece of logic in the hypervisor. Uh, that, honestly, is a patch that got put in the patch queue and it wasn't put in by me and therefore I haven't really figured out whether we still need it or not. Um, I mean, from our perspective, we, we have a security requirement that uh, if, when a domain is decided, has been destroyed, we, we needed all remnants of it out of memory before any other domain is allowed to be created. So we don't allow the lazy zeroization that currently is done in Zen. Right, I can I can see why. And I think that's what I was referring to as well. With uh, I think we had some common criteria related patches that did memory scrubbing, but I don't know what happened with those. Uh, they all got sent upstream. I think everything there is upstream now. So if upstream has this memory zeroing, then what's the remaining security issue? Is it is it? Zeroization at the time of, of destroy? No, it's not. Um, right. No, no, no. What? No. That's wrong. So there, there are three different things that we're talking about uh, around this table. Uh, the patch from the Zen server patch queue is specifically about boot time. It's an interaction with the boot time memory scrub versus microcode loading. That, I think, is a bug. I think it's specific to Broadwell hardware. Um, the, there was a general change upstream with how the heap works, and it is currently in a nonsense state, um, where scrubbing, uh, scrubbing memory was deferred to the idle threads, um, and it, it was a mess. Um, that's the one where both Cube, uh, sorry, both OpenXT have a problem because it, it used to be that memory was scrubbed synchronously in the domain kill hypercall. Um, then it was deferred. Uh, then it was deferred to idle, so it was uh, potentially still dirty. Um, for Zen Server, the thing that we did for cr common criteria was not about, uh, so the common criteria statement that we make is that a, a, v, a new VM can't get memory of an old VM. Um, so the deferred scrubbing is uh, fine-ish from our point of view. Um, I, I was picking my battles. Um, the thing that we do do in Zen Server um, that is that we so we ended up upstreaming this, but it's off by default. It's turned on in one of our patches. Um, is to always scrub memory handed back via decrease reservation because that was that's the easy way to get memory get memory back into Zen's heap without being scrubbed because the initial implementation of it trusted everything that a guest kernel did. Um, so. Uh, there were there was a path th uh, through decrease reservation where a guest could hand back a dirty page um, in, in, into into Zen. Um, this needs look various bits of this do need looking at. Um, I don't have any good answers. I 
frankly, frankly, we should reinsert that because um, the the plan to make it asynchronous had not been tested. Uh, let's put it that way. Well, regardless. Um, uh, I mean, frankly, I was thinking an option to the main kill hypercore, but yeah, sure, command line parameter, something like that. Um, at the end of the day, it's it's a platform-wide decision, and it will be the same for everything. So yeah, command line parameter should be fine. Well, uh, there's also the matter of security, and in general, it is a helpful security posture to state the invariant that if the VM is not running, its VM is not, its memory is not there. If you defer it, you don't really know when that memory has disappeared from the, from the actual RAM of the machine, which is annoying at least. Well, you, 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 you can't make that guarantee. Yes. No, not, not, not with the in increasing, um, fun memory technologies that we're getting on the DRAM bus. I mean, we, we, can, we can say we've zeroed it. We can't guarantee it's not persistent somewhere. Yeah. I mean, we can do the best we can. But, but the, yeah. And, and amongst other things, uh, the guest kernel can't know that there isn't a snapshot save state of it somewhere else. We, the hypervisor, can know that we didn't do that, but it's... Uh, that, that's a different standard. That depends on the, on the, that depends on the uh, trust level that the, that the guest has on the hypervisor and how much trust it needs to, it needs to have. Um, but in general, from the point of view of the hypervisor itself, uh, it's a better security posture to not have to make assumptions about, okay, are all the secrets of this virtual machine effectively uh, wiped in a way that I, they cannot be um, snooped or, or inspected by new VMs that have not coexisted with the old one, but could potentially read those secrets before they are um, evicted from the memory. Yeah, I mean, Hmm. And going a bit back on the um, on the interactions between scrubbing and microcode loading, uh, I do wonder why do we care? Send rendezvous all the CPUs on the LMI handler while doing the no, microcode loading. This is the boot part only. The APs come up sequentially. But there is no concurrent activities on them. Yes, there is when you are scrubbing in the idle loop. Because you boot, you, you boot. You boot the, the BSP is busy coordinating. AP1 comes up, loads microcode, and then starts doing scrubbing. Then AP2 comes up, does, does microcode, then starts scrubbing. AP3 comes up, does microcode, then starts scrubbing. And the problem with the Intel, uh, the problem with the Broadwell system was that um, you, you had uh, you had a set of cores and an L3 cache slice and an L3 cache slice with some lasered out cores above it. Um, so they were sharing snoop, co snoop queues. Um, so yeah, that, that, that patch was specific to boot and I, d I don't suggest taking it out of the Zen server patch queue. Oh, um, there are a few questions on Jitsi chat, if anyone can read those. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so cycling back uh, to, the, uh, to the patches, um, most of the patches that we take on the Arch Linux site are from cubes. 
though most of them are also in libxl um we also do happen to take the zen console uh patches that i think demi or marek made let me check real quick uh yes Marek uh, made the uh, Zen console patches. Um, I don't know if Cube uses them at the moment. I don't think. Uh, no, I don't think we use them right now. Because I was. I think you told me that um, the Zen console patches were used for the stop domains to uh, not use QEMU for that. But instead, use the actual Zen consoles. Yes, uh, this those uh, the Zen console part is needed if you care about live migration of HVM with Linux subdomain. Uh, but yeah, we don't do that in Cube, so we don't care about this part. So we simply uh, break uh, live migration. Right. Um, I don't know how much of a requirement live migration is for the uh, users on the Arch side, because I'm not really familiar with who uses uh, Zen on Arch. It's, I just know that we're going to move it into extra. Yeah. It's not just live migration, it's also save and restore. Right. So okay, so with all those patches, save and restore wouldn't work? Uh, it would work with uh, QME in Tom Zero. Yeah, it's only when you've got the magic, um, the magic HVM QEMU stub full domain that <laughs> um, we're, we're looking to get rid of for other reasons. Um, to be honest, for uh, well, you're, you're looking to turn the full that full domain into a unikernel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, it's a full Linux running QEMU as PID one, I think. No. There is a shell running as p one. There is a shell init, init script that starts QMU and MDEV and pulls audio in some cases. Um, yeah, a bunch of stuff. Right, okay. DHCP server. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated been, uh, than that. I've been working on making a more Arch Linux specific uh, script for that, um, but it's essentially pretty much copied most of uh, Marek's patches for the Linux subdomains. Um, so you said that you were, were going to move to a unikernel with that? Um, yeah, so this is something I would like to see. Uh, I hope uh, to talk about it uh, on the next design session. Unicraft, Unicraft one is some sometime later today um, yes uh, because the Linux subdomain is quite large it uh, uses over 100 megabytes uh, from and we we are not happy about that um, yeah so if there is some better option and I hope Unicraft is a better option we are going to migrate to that but it's going to be quite a lot of work so it's not going to happen like tomorrow. <laughs> right, 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 that makes sense. Um, the Unicraft kernel, as I understand it, is essentially um, compiling a Linux kernel together with the application, no. am I correct? There is no Linux involved. It, it, it's specifically no Linux. Uh, what they have done is taken a large subset of the Linux system calls and implemented, um, well, bug compatible with Linux where possible uh, on those, such that you can take a regular normal Linux application and link it together with the Unicraft kernel stubs. Um, so the, the Linux compatibility there is at the effectively the um, user space boundary, except it's all munched together into a single um, single address space. Uh, but yes, there is right. specifically no actual Linux in it. Right, okay, and then Unicraft is built to specifically run as a virtual machine. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, Unicraft can put itself out as PV or a PVH guest. It can uh, get stuff that runs natively under KVM and under Hyper-V as well. Um, So that, that should be a lot better uh, resource-wise. But that would also, I assume, get rid of the need for these uh, Zen console patches? Uh, no, the Zen console patches are for uh, effectively the serialized um, state that needs to move to the other host. Yeah, it, it very much depends how uh, the... Uh, save and restore is going to be implemented there because uh, I uh, the current implementation uses uh, co extra consoles only because that's how it was do done in uh, QEMU traditional with MinUS. Uh, there is no fundamental reason to keep doing that. Uh, there are op other options like Vitran or uh, maybe some. Uh, maybe simply 9PFS or... Yeah, 9PFS yeah. right into a socket might be the easiest way. Yeah, probably. There are a bunch of different methods. Even with Linux tab domain, you need to patch Linux to work, uh, to uh, console work for this, because otherwise I got... Uh, it, it was dropping some data because some... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I've seen the patch. Um, yeah. it, it makes the transfer or well the writing to the console binary i think rather than just regular text something like that i would have to actually check the uh to actually check right now yeah so um, the the, co uh, the console approach uh, is something that works but it's not an ideal one so it's not like the con uh, yes yeah. I mean, as as to the as to the Arch Linux patch queue, um, obviously that the, there is a package there that pre-exists, but is in a bit of a dodgy state, a bit of an unmaintained state, if I understand it right. Um, the current Zen package is still in the Okay. So I think we are behind one version. What? Which uh, version of Zen are you on? But after after more testing, we should be able to uh, be on the latest Zen version again. W w which version are you currently on? Uh, currently, we are on four dot eighty eighteen dot one. Oh, in which case, that's very easy to get up to date. Uh, four eighteen is the most recent release of Zen. 419 is, well, hopefully imminent, but proving stubborn to actually get to real code freeze. <laughs> All right, so unless I am wrong, I don't think your latest um, bug fixes in terms of, um, what was it? Uh, the bronze prediction stuff, I think. Um, isn't in there right now. So the minor minor releases on a stable branch, so the 4.18, I mean, you're on dot one at the moment, but um, uh, moving forwards to dot two and dot three should be just a case of update the hash you're, you're based on. Um, and you ought to do that uh, we because- are, We are pulling from the Git directly, so our hash mm, is essentially yes. just skip uh, yeah, that okay. That that's fine. But as uh, there are release tags in in those as well. And the the, yes, the tag we are pulling from is stable four dot eighteen. So real real quick, um, I, it looks like we're about done here in five minutes. Uh, yeah, um, we got five okay, minutes I, until I, we're I kicked out. Since it sounds like um, all of us have a lot of LibXL patches, could we maybe work on um, you know Google spreadsheet stuff then? kind of coordinate what it, what are all our LibXL patches, figure out which ones we have in common, and then try to maybe work collectively to get those up and help reduce all our patch queues? Uh, what's the situation? 
what's the effective process for upstreaming them? Because from what I understand, we have some uh, uh, deficiencies in uh, main maintainers for Tulsac. So uh, right now we have zero tool stack maintainers. As of next week, we'll be we'll, no. As of next week, we'll be back up to one maintainer. Um, uh, and Anthony left Citrix, and he's starting at Vates on Monday. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I, I didn't think that was going to cause his maintainer to drop. Well, technically, he's changing uh, his registered email address. Uh, but he's, he's, he's also been, been out of the office for a month as he's moving from Cambridge back to France. So uh, he's, he's also been um, not contactable for any maintainership-related um, things. Right, but I mean, this is not going to happen tomorrow, right? He's probably, gonna, he's probably not capable of the mm. second Q3 before anything real comes of this, right? I'm just yeah. suggesting a path we start moving. And the the reality is at the moment that Ant Anthony is the uh, is the named maintainer and uh, the person doing the next amount of review and maintainership in LibXL is actually Jason. I think that's through uh, necessity rather than wish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, we probably better start wrapping it up here, seeing as uh, uh, well. We were given the warning uh, a short while ago. Um, no. Zen safety requirements of streaming is next. Uh, yes. Uh, right. Uh, who has the action to start a Google spreadsheet? So I think that's about the only action we've got from this. Can I nominate somebody? I, I don't mind uh, setting up the Google spreadsheet. Um, well volunteered. Thank you. <laughs> but it would be, uh, it would be a few days. Um, uh, that's, that's entirely I fine. Like to, uh, I would like to thank you again, um, Andrew and uh, Murray, uh, for, for stepping up for me. Uh, no problem. You're uh, very welcome. Yeah. Right, in which case we should probably end this now before we get shouted at even more. Uh, thank you very much. And